for playing that. Good afternoon, everybody. Jai Bheem. Uh, good evening to those calling from India. Um, happy March. Happy Women's History Month. Um, what you just heard was uh, a beautiful uh, music video by uh, Sunny Singh uh, called Koi Bole Ram. Uh, and we're, we will he hear from Sunny Singh a little bit later. My name is Prachi Patankar. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome you all. I'll be moderating the session on behalf of ICWI, India Civil Watch International. It's a diaspora-based membership-centered campaign group based in North America. Um, uh, ICWI supports social movements and activists dealing with political issues unfolding in India and challenges forces also in North America that support the growth of uh, supremacist, communal, exploitative politics in India and our communities here. Our membership uh, and leadership comes from multiple diasporic movement formations and is also made up of people from Dalit Bahujan, Ambedkarite left, anti-communal, feminist struggles, um, and with organizing histories that date to over two decades in India and in the diaspora. Today, um, ICWI will be holding a biennial general body meeting. And as part of that meeting, 
this is a public event and conversation that we're doing, um, which we do on timely struggles that inspire us and from which we can learn collectively. Um, just a note before uh, we start that we only have an hour with our speakers today and then we'll bring in Sunny Singh. Um, so we're, we're going to limit our question and answers from the audience um, for this call, uh, event, but do comment, uh, you know, you know, comment on the question and answer and uh, sections and, you know, share your thoughts and if there are specific questions, we can uh, always try to get back to you and maybe post some answers on our website later on after we check in with our speakers. Today's event focuses on inspiring farmers movement and the Shaheen Bagh movement um, against the Draconian Citizenship Amendment Act. Um, and Shaheen Bagh and farmers protests have been two of the largest mobilizations in the history of independent India, separated by only the global pandemic, which is a, a huge thing that's happened and affected people across the globe. And both of these struggles are my, marked by solid presence and leadership of women at the forefront, forefront of these struggles. And the popularity of these movements, which has been felt globally, also suggests that while fascistic forces have taken over the state, the people will not easily bend to their will. And the power of people's resistance is felt visibly through the resiliency of both the movements that sustained the physical and visual presence for so many months. Uh, Farmers Movement has been demonstrating a uh, united front um, of so many young people, students, journalists, comedians, labor rights activists, so as we, as we, people living in the diaspora, are inspired, uh, we support these movements from afar, we also see this in the context of not only the rise of Hindu fundamentalism in India, but also a rise of authoritarianism globally. And so to so discuss this and how it connects to global solidarity questions, um, we are speaking with um, Navsharan Singh, the feminist labor activist who's connected to both the farmers movement and the protests against the CAA and Bill Fletcher Jr. Um, he's a US-based labor organizer and left strategist, um, someone who has I've had the pleasure to work, work working with uh, as part of the anti-war um, movement for a long time. Um, as we think about that, we actually, uh, this weekend mark um, the anniversary of the US invasion of Iraq. It's been 18 years since that happened. Um, we're going to talk about the farmers movement and the and the protests. Um, and this is something, you know, for me as someone who comes from a farming family in Maharashtra, who grew up in peasant movement organizing, this is particularly close to my heart. Um, our family land came to my grandparents from uh, who were landless labor family before, and it came to us because uh, land reforms post independence that attempted to abolish tenancy and transfer ownership to tenants. And so we have the land we have today because of movements uh, that, uh, that work to get this kind of um, rights for people. Um, so this is very close to me. Um, so I wanted to get started uh, with Navsharan. Uh, Navsharan, could you start um, by talking about the farmers protests? Um, you've been on the ground participating, supporting, especially highlighting and writing about women's participation in these struggles. Um, so why have the farmers been protesting uh, for what has been over six months now? And if you could talk a little bit about, you know, what is at the root of this struggle? And, you know, you've been on the ground, we see videos and we see images, but if you could also paint a picture of what it feels like to be on the ground with such, uh, you know, the massiveness of the protests that, that they are, um, and you know the tractors and the encampments. So if you could just talk about that a little bit as as well, that would be great. And welcome. If you, uh, please do mute yourself. And, and thanks, Prachi, and thanks ICWI for having me over today. Delighted to speak about uh, uh, the historic and most joyous um, farmers movement in India. Uh, see, the farm protests, which began with the three farm laws, um, actually, uh, which were passed um, by the parliament in last September, has now become a very big movement. It's not confined to three laws anymore. And there are really a million reasons for farmers now to be protesting in Delhi. Um, just a quick background to... Um, 
the um, this movement, um, government introduced three bills, uh, three farm bills in the monsoon session of the parliament last September. And together, these three bills proposed to relax restrictions on three things. Number one, on purchase and sale of uh, farm produce, uh, on stocking of uh, under essential commodities. And the third thing is it laid down a framework for contract farming. The bills were introduced from September 14, uh, without discussion, passed in Lok Sabha, the lower house, went to the upper house, passed without much discussion, sent to the president, and before anyone knew, they were, president gave his assent and the minutes were gazetted um, on September. September 27th. So from 14th September to 27th in less than two weeks, suspending any democratic process, suspending any parliamentary process, the farm bills were bulldozed, uh, affecting um, a fundamental change, a fundamental um, transformation in the existing ways in which farming, um, the regulatory framework in which farming was happening, and turned it into a pro-corporate um, bills. Now, farmers feared, and rightly so, that the three farm bills which were introduced were detrimental to the farming community, especially the marginal and small uh, farmers. And we uh, must know 86% of India's farmers are actually small farmers. They are less than um, five acres uh, of land. So all, while all the three bills were passed in the name of um, um, freeing the farming community from the clutches of commission agents and this or that, the farming community knew that these bills were actually sounding a death knell for small farmers. Um, agriculture sector reforms have been on the agenda of the state uh, for the last couple of decades. And policy community, which is committed to neoliberal reforms, have been actually wanting uh, to have these reforms um, stressing the need to shift uh, large scale, the um, people who are dependent on agriculture to work in the factories, to work in the service sector as cheap labor. However, there are no good jobs. All jobs that India is producing in manufacturing and in um, service sector are dirty, demeaning, and they were not enough of a reason for uh, farming communities uh, to actually the entire workforce to shift leave farming and move to cities. The only choice it gave them was to get reduced to perennial casual labor in unwelcoming cities. And the world saw how uh, cities turned their backs to working people in India when um, the lockdown happened and workers had to leave the cities to go back to the villages they came from. Uh, on foot walking hundreds of kilometers. So um, the, the, the process, of this process, which had to be done on behalf of corporates uh, was initiated several times before also through commissions of uh, agriculture, expert commissions, um, this and that, but they could not succeed. Well, um, making COVID um, uh, pandemic uh, as uh, there is, uh, um, taking it as an opportunity, the state decided to push through what it could not do earlier. Not only the farm bills, um, it's important to know that crucial labor reform uh, was also bulldozed in the same monsoon session of the parliament in September. And the three um, basic tenets of the labor reforms that happened at the same time parallelly was to minimize the state uh, regulation, uh, state's role in regulating safety uh, and security of the workplace. It also reduced and diluted the duties of the employer and took away the right to unionize from the uh, labor. So um, the farm bills, which were going to free up farming communities to join the ranks of labor, were going to join this rightless labor. 
Um, and in parallel, as we all know, and you've been uh, working on these questions also, the disturbing suppression of basic rights and freedoms through the use of preventive detention laws and special legislation was also entrenched in the same period. The hubris uh, this process displayed was not lost um, on anyone and least of all on farmers. So while the labor couldn't actually pressed being casual labor, the farmers led by farm unions in Punjab challenged the new laws which were passed on the sheer dint of arrogant power. And they demanded the laws to be repealed. They uh, uh, had uh, protests in Punjab for almost three months, seeking the repeal of laws. And when they were not heard, they gave a call to come to Delhi on the 26th, 27th of November. And uh, they said to people, I mean, it, it was interesting. The farm leader said, that people in Punjab do not only know how to farm, how to grow, um, uh, produce, but they also know how to defend their farms. And they came, and they came, uh, uh, Punjab farmers, uh, unions, convoy began on tractor trolleys, thousands of them. Uh, they made their way into Delhi on 26. On their way, they were met with massive state repression, but they couldn't be stopped. And we all saw how they were uh, stopped by Haryana police um, and at Delhi borders, but they could not be stopped. And they came equipped with food, equipped with um, uh, all the basic essentials that they required, utensils and blankets and food stocks uh, to last them for months. And they announced, we are here, we are not leaving till these laws are um, repealed. And there was a strong presence of women. Women were in very much part of this convoy. So as soon as they came, so since you asked me how it looks there, as soon as they came, and I went there, I think two days later, because uh, I couldn't just uh, find um, how to get there also, they quickly set up mini townships. In the, at the two borders, Singu and Tikri are the two Delhi borders. And the, the thousands of tractor trolleys which came, they set up these townships, gave them names like um, Bibi Gulab Kaur Nagar, Chacha Ajit Singh Nagar. They set up libraries in the name of Bhagat Singh Library. Um, Tens of uh, health clinics were set up. Uh, food came, milk came from uh, food, milk came from neighboring Haryana. Uh, community kitchens were set up. Uh, and there was camaraderie everywhere. Um, there was plenty of food to eat uh, for everyone and uh, from the community kitchens. And, and, and they just set up. After they set up uh, these uh, kitchens and libraries and all, they also uh, set up, as soon as the kitchens were running, camps were set, makeshift platforms. So there were a number of three, four stages were um, uh, made. And when, very soon, there were not only speeches from the states, but cultural performances began to happen. And Punjab, as you know, has a very rich tradition of a progressive culture. And there's been a strong cultural movement. So there were drama troops coming, there was singing, there were dancing, there was music and very, very inspiring music. So um, all these uh, platforms will begin these performances at 11 a.m. and will continue till 4 a.m and it continues till now and um, there are also a couple of talkies um, which are now uh, trolley talk talkies for instance where documentaries are run um, at night so uh, once uh, this happened there was also um, uh, farmers started marking important dates very soon right after 27th 28th when they got settled 10th december was International Human Rights Day, which was marked by one of the biggest farm union at the farm site. They adorned the stage with the portraits of human rights defenders, intellectuals, Shaheen Bagh activists who were arrested uh, without trial and under draconian preventive detention laws. And farmers asked, um, 
that these be people be released um, uh, unconditionally. They marked then Women's uh, Women Farmers Day um, in January, Sikh Gurus uh, Martyrdom Days. They also marked Guru Ravi Das Day. Uh, there was um, March 8th. International Women's Day, and I think I was there. Um, over 100,000 women were there, and um, I surfed um, the net. And I think it was by far the biggest rally on the planet Earth on that day. They, there was a sea. There was an ocean of uh, basanti dupattas or green dupattas and women came from all over punjab and haryana and international women's day was uh, marked there um there were also then youth days and um, on 23rd is uh, bhagat singh's martyrdom day which again is being uh, going to be marked there um, uh, at the morchas so um, now the morchas uh, just to say are a site they are a school for uh, protesting farmers to learn what is going on in India um, politically, economically, and also try and see the connection of their demands, of their protest with what's happening outside. There are people coming from Adivasi areas, there are people coming from fishery, fishing uh, communities and Adivasis. So there is now uh, a large um, gathering and also where um, solidarities uh, and alliances are being built. Mm -hmm. So even today, uh, according to police, uh, there are 50,000 farmers uh, sitting, which we can um, easily say that if the police is saying 50,000, there are at least 100,000 farmers at the two protest site. So, so that's what um, it looks like running into kilometers, uh, the right. tractor trolleys and the makeshift huts. Um, farmers, very uh, raw energy and mm -hmm. um, very calm confidence of the people, of working people, putting together a wonderful um, protest mm -hmm. site um, in Delhi. That's that's so, thank you so much, Navshan, for um, just painting the picture. And I think the kind of the important connection that you also draw about what was happening for the labor rights movement or labor rights at the same time. I'm, I'm also, I wanted to bring in Bill, um, kind of bringing it here in terms of the connection that we may have in the United States. You know, the, the farmers protests also, um, and also the Dalit labor rights leader, you know, the course arrests that really got a lot of attention in the United States, whether it was, you know, Rihanna po posting about and why we were not talking about the former farmers protests. Of course, she got a lot of uh, trolling and anti-black uh, trolling from um, the right wings uh, in, in, in India. Mina Harris posting about a call for solidarity, both for Naudip Kaur and farmers protests. So much has been uh, such captured the imagination and inspired so many people beyond just Indians or South Asians, but just people living here in the United States. So I wanted to talk, you know, bring bring in Bill, you know, to see, you know, what connections do you see uh, for movement building here, both around issues of labor rights and you know agricultural uh, rights, but climate justice is a, you know, environmental justice is a big thing and thread throughout this and anti-authoritarianism. So, uh, you know, Bill would love for you to come in and talk a little bit about what you see as a, you know, left strategist and, and a, and a long time global strat, uh, global solidarity activist. Um, you know, if you can talk a little bit about that. Well, thank you, Prashi. And I, um, it's an honor uh, to be here. Uh, sort of a surprise and, and I mean I could have sat here and listened to uh, Navjaran speak for the rest of the you know the hour I mean uh, I was I was just simply riveted by her presentation so let me just offer a few uh, modest thoughts um, the 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 struggle uh, that that's underway in India right now around the farmers um, is a struggle that strikes me as a struggle against neoliberal authoritarianism. Uh, it's not just an economic battle. Uh, it, is, it, it has anti-fascist implications. Uh, 
the um, and the the momentum the that has been built um, is is incredibly inspiring. The question of the, for this movement, and someone raised the question about the French far, French uh, Yellow Jackets movement, uh, which which actually sparked my response, is ultimately where is it going? What's the end point? Um, and because one of the things that we've seen uh, historically is that there's uh, the capability of building mass protests and massive protests that the other side waits out and they wait for, wait for the people to get tired, quite literally. Um, and so the question then is, so how does the movement identify victory? And this is something that I think has global implications because a battle that began or begins in this case as a defensive battle has the opportunity to switch gears and become offensive. And I mean that in the best sense of the word. And uh, does it become in fact a battle for political power? Uh, does it become a battle to, to challenge the dominant, the ruling consensus in India? You know, in the United States, we have lost most of our farmer population. The small uh, uh, farmer is a, uh, a fraction of what we see in India. And uh, farming has been taken over by, you know, uh, mega agricultural conglomerates, um, which I suspect is the direction that the forces around Modi would like to see happen in India. So there's every neg negative lesson to be learned from our experience here in the United States in what has happened to the family farmer and essentially their move towards extermination. Um, let me just end by saying that uh, one of the things that, you know, I know that the three of us spoke about um, earlier this week that I'm sort of obsessed with is what is the character of 21st century global solidarity? And, and so when we see what's happening in India, what should the rest of the world do? Progressive forces. And how do we move away from uh, resolutionary responses as opposed to revolutionary responses? You know, it's like when we, you know, people will pass resolutions in different gatherings supporting the farmers in India. Okay, that's nice. But like beyond that, what do we do? And, and that's one of the things that I would hope that the movement in India can tell the rest of the world, this is exactly what we need to do. You wanna help us? This is, what you, this is how you can contribute. Just as the Palestinians have said, you, know, you wanna help? Support the boycott divestment sanctions movement. It's very concrete. And I think that uh, that's what I would hope that the farmers movement does. Thank you so much, Bill. And I think um, we, I want to definitely get back to these, this, these questions of, you know, how, what does it look like to win in the larger sense, uh, whether it's through the immediate demands of the farmers protests um, or the immediate de demands of the CAA, which, you know, we ultimately really didn't win, um, to winning the, a larger struggle, um, you know, and how, what does it look like to be, really be in solidarity in terms of what actions can we do? But before we get to that, I, I do want to turn back, you know, we, 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 this event is about the farmers' protest, but also Chahin Bagh a little bit, right? So we, I want to ask you, when you look at the participation and the lead, uh, you know, leadership of these movements, um, whether you look at the U.S. context and a BLM was founded and inspired by Black queer women who, and, and if you look at Shaheen Bagh, it was defined by the strong presence and leadership of Muslim women and elder elders in many cases. Um, and of course, um, these movements uh, are joined by student leaders and young people, many of whom are young women, uh, whether it's Disha Ravi, who was recently arrested um, uh, for editing a toolkit by Greta Thunberg, another uh, uh, person who was identified as a, woman, a young girl, um, in support of the farmers' protests, and or whether you look at um, JNU uh, union leader Aisha Ghosh or Jamia's Aisha Rana, um, or the uh, rights labor act, uh, uh, leader who was recently released, Nodi Kaur. Um, women's fierce leadership is really at the participation, and not just the participation, but at the at the kind of forefront of these struggles. So, 
never sure it would be great if you you know you've written about this um, for both of these protests if you could talk a little bit about you know what is the role of women in these movements um, you know you know how are these laws the farmers bill and the citizenship act how do they affect women and their their ideas about citizenship economic freedom existence right to public sphere etc and i think some of these questions you know more people joining movements and and connecting with each other is also how we build a larger solidarity and and build strong movements to be able to win so would love for you to talk a little bit about and the women's leadership in that right um thanks prachi and we will return to bill's um very fundamental questions that he also raised but let me just uh, quickly share with you that uh, uh, shaheen bagh was another beautiful movement and a very significant movement also it rose spontaneously and most of the women who participated in the protest um uh, against the highly draconian and discriminatory um, uh, citizenship amendment uh, act um, at the delhi shaheen bag and later in other parts um, of the country um, these women were first time protesters um during that day those days i actually traveled extensively because the movement against uh, citizenship amendment act was happening in um, uh, it started in shaheen bag but it spread to many other parts of uh, india and um, another hub was um, up where women were not only fighting against the uh, discriminatory law but they were also fighting fighting the very repressive regime of yogi adityanath the chief minister of uh, up um, and all these places the movement was led by muslim women and this was something which was historic um, it had not happened in a long time and these women came out to protest against the um, uh, laws but they also came against the gendered idea of citizenship and let me just explain that when the women um women came out they knew that women experience differentiated citizenship rights which is very evident um, uh in the public private binary where public is for men and private is um, for women and this uh, binary dictates that women will stay uh, inside and men will occupy the public space in this uh, ntca protest women came out so they came out and they claimed the public and then they also claimed the republic that's what they wanted to send the message out and many of the women at shaheen bagh had no prior experience of political engagement they jumped into the protest from what they had seen in um, preparation for the national register of citizenship which was happening uh, in assam at the same time which actually paved the way for the um, caa also in parliament where um, in the name of um, weeding out bangladeshi um intruders from indian soil a national register of citizenship uh, was started and uh, the terms of being included in the national register of citizenship were unambiguously laid out there were three ways in which you could claim citizenship it was through the possession of land it was through the lineage to family and the presence in uh, state records women as we all know do not own land their only relation through their labor they labor on land they they have no land they have no papers their lineage their family um lineage and identity is transformed when they get married then from daughters to they become daughters in law once again losing the identity losing the family uh, connection and the lineage and they are hardly present in any other state records so the nrc experience of women made women all women especially muslim women who as all odds are stacked against muslims in india at the moment women from muslim community knew vulnerability was stark 
they would not have the kind of papers and the citizens, the concept of citizenship, which was uh, dependent on showing the papers and establishing your connections with land or the country were simply not there. And that is why the beautiful slogan rose from these protest sites, which said, hum kagaz nahi dikhayenge. So everybody said, we will not show any papers. So all of us also joined um, the slogan, which rose from Shaheen Bagh and then reverberated in entire India. Hum kagaz nahi dikhayenge. So uh, women at Tikri and Singhu, the farming women, actually are not first time protesters. Their participation is also not spontaneous. Women in Punjab have been mobilized for at least a decade now, mostly by left farm unions. And it's the left farm unions which have um, mobilized women, uh, brought them out from homes into public sphere. We do not see women in Akali party um, um, uh, rallies. We do not see women uh, in Amadi party rallies, but we see thousands of women um, in left uh, uh, farm unions uh, rallies. So over these um, um, years when left farm unions mobilized women, you encountered in these these unions have been encountering the question of women's citizenship, their right to public sphere, their right to participate in popular struggles. I would not say that these questions have been resolved, but the unions have been engaging with these questions with uh, these movements for at least the last 12 years, um, regularly going there. And I know that the many unions actually mark International Women's Day every 8th March. They bring speakers, they talk about women's operation, they try and learn, and they also mentor the next generation of women leaders. Now, Shaheen Bagh saw women coming out, not only grandmothers, but young women also. And we know that that many of them are, are now arrested and they are um, in jail without any... Um, so it's, um, um, it's coming out of um, women in all... And when, oh, what are these women doing? If women are protesting... Okay, we're losing um, Naushan a little bit here, um, but we'll, we'll come back to Naushan. I, I did I did want to um, go to um, turn to Bill. Um, so you know, I think in terms of um, parallels, I'm thinking also about similarities between movements. Uh, you know, whether it's in the United States uh, and uh, globally and India, and also parallels between how the right wing, um, you know, what is what they're learning from each other. And Naomi Klein recently, you know, when she was writing about or speaking about the farmers movement and the digital repression and the criminalization of young activists who are supporting these or criminalization of activists in general who are supporting these movements, spoke about how right wing governments are already internationalists, right? They're already in solidarity with each other in terms of how they approach the very systemic, uh, systematic repression and criminalization of dissent using digital uh, repression, you know, and, and really co-opting, you know, places like Twitter and, and, uh, and Facebook and, and really taking over that in, in the many cases. Um, that's happening. And, and, and while they do that, on the other hand, the real perpetrators of communal violence and pogroms and caste-based atrocities, they go on perpetrating that. They go on living freely doing that. Um, and so, and, and the other hand, in terms of the similarities also of uh, movements, uh, I'm also kind of thinking about the way that kind of Naushiran described the presence of um, uh, farmers and families, uh, you know, holding a space for a long period of time, right? And, you know, bringing their uh, 
you know, food and cooking food and providing food, not just for the people there, but anybody who's coming through there. That is also similar how Standing Rock or, you know, how Occupy Wall Street did a protest for a long time. And Standing Rock also had, you know, provided care and education for families who were there coming from far away. So, you know, I would love, uh, Bill, if you could uh, just to hear from you in terms of, um, you know, what do you how 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 do you understand the emergence of right wing uh, globally uh, and this right wing populism, um, and in in the times of emergence of movements like BLM and CAA and RC etc. What does this mean for the left and uh, you know how do we understand support them participate in them promote them while also facing this huge 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 uh, global right wing um, you know and uh, resurgence. So um, since you misscheduled this and it should have been four hours as opposed to one hour, um, I, I will try to keep it as, as brief as possible. Also, I want to get back to listening to what Nev Sharon has to say. Um, and I actually want to build on something that she said as, as a way of answering or responding to your point. Um, one of the things about global right-wing populism, including but not limited to fascism, is how patriarchal, misogynist it is. Um, and it is a, it's a movement, and you see this around the planet, that's based largely on uh, men who are economically redundant and who's, um, and, and there's been a challenge to gender roles. And right-wing populism appeals to that because it's basically saying, we've got to turn the clock back to a point when men were men. And, and women, in fact, have gotten in the way. And so what you see in country after country are these right-wing populist movements that either are, are both patriarchal and racist, uh, always looking for scapegoats. And so to see movements when uh, women are taking the lead in actually combating this is critical. And it's a, it's a very, very important lesson for the rest of the planet. Um, and uh, because, because what's, what's very unsettling is that some of these right-wing populists are even led by women who articulate patriarchal views. But that's for another discussion. You know, Rashi, I, I talk about um, Axis 21. And Axis 21 is the way I think of the global right-wing populist alignment that has emerged. It, it just like there was an axis between Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, and Imperial Japan, uh, we have an axis 21 that includes uh, Putin, it includes Trump, it includes the Front National, it includes Modi, I mean, it includes Duterte, that there's this strange, but not so strange alignment. And in each case, there's certain things that are very, very in common. Um, one is, I mentioned before, about patriarchy and, and active and unapologetic male supremacy, uh, racism, uh, the suppression of opposition, the, um, the, the developments of myths of the past. All, uh, all of this takes place in the context of the crisis that's been created by and the crisis of neoliberalism. And so these right-wing populist forces pose as alternatives to neoliberalism, even when in some cases they're advancing neoliberalism. And I say in some cases because they don't always do that. If you look at a case like Poland, the right-wing populists there advance a kind of welfareism, welfare statism, but they do it in a way where they have racialized the opposition and they've said that these are to be the benefits of the real Poles. So we should understand that the opportunism of right-wing populism and fascism knows no bounds. And that at different moments, they can uh, uh, shift gears. And one moment they can seem to be articulating neoliberalism. And another moment, all of a sudden, it sounds like they're advancing the welfare state. Uh, what we've got to understand is that their objectives is, objective is the complete and total suppression of popular democratic opposition and the realignment of the state uh, so that the notion of any kind of uh, redistribution and on any equitable level is eliminated. 
and they, they look to their base, who is angry about, the, about a number of things, not just economics. They're angry about the way the world has changed. Uh, the right-wing right -wing movements are movements that see the future in the past. And I think what we see in the farmers movement is we see the future. And that's what I think that is so critical for us to embrace. Yeah, th and thank you, Bill, for also, I think one of the things that uh, you, you pointed to the question of race and you know, the profound racism that really exists in the, in the both the, the systemic way that the right wing is going about things, but also the rhetoric that is really increasing throughout. And mm -hmm. I think this is something that, you know, we're, when we're looking at what is happening in India too, caste-based atrocities have increased tremendously. Um, so, you know, I also wanted to, bring, you know, bring Nelshan back. And if you want to finish some of your, the thoughts that you were had, um, you were speaking about before, and maybe um, bring in this um, question of caste here, right? You know, you mentioned the, you had mentioned in your, uh, I think your articles before, the invisibilization of not only women farmers, but landless laborers, right, who um, most of them are Dalit and account for also half of the suicide rates in Punjab and I think other parts of the country too. So I want, I want to, I want, would love for you to talk about the, you know, both the question of caste and, you know, how are, how are Dalit communities in Punjab and other places responding to this farmer movement? How are they participating in it? Um, and because there is a, there's a real class caste differentiation in terms of, you know, who holds a farm land, um, and it tends to be, you know, a dominant caste. Whether it's in Punjab, you're talking about Jat communities, and landless laborers tend to be Delhi communities. So, if you could reflect on both these contradictions, and you know, but at the same time, you know, now the core and other people who are really making those connections and and participating the, in this as labor rights activists, but also as Delhi rights activists, talking about these connections, and so you know racism and you know growth and racism globally but also casteism and caste supremacy uh in in our region too so if you could talk about about that and if there's anything that you wanted to finish from early on that would be great too sure sure thank you and, and sorry my internet is unstable today for some reason uh but just want to finish one point from the question which we were discussing earlier and bill actually mentioned it so wonderfully on the um, patriarchal and misogyny of the right-wing movements. As I was saying that unions have encountered the question of women's citizenship with all earnestness, whereas um, the state, um, actually our India's uh, Supreme Court and Chief um, uh, Justice of India, in fact, remarked um, very recently in connection with women's participation in uh, farmers' movement, he said, um, well, why are women um, being kept in the protest? And he mentioned the chief justice. He said, I want to convey it to farm leaders to send the women back. Um, and in his imagination, farm leaders uh, and farmers were only men, and they just brought women as they brought uh, sacks of um, um, food and provisions. They also brought some women in their trolleys. And um, this is the Chief Justice saying, and it's not, I would say it's not misogyny, it's not even patriarchal attitude uh, or a um, uh, attitude of a male, uh, it's actually about when women are claiming the social space, it is to deny them that. Because the same, very same Supreme Court has um, uh, denied bail to Sudha Bharadwaj, for instance, uh, who's, who's a woman, a human rights defender, and who's incarcerated without even her trial beginning for the last two years. The courts have denied bails of Devangana, Natasha Narwal, and uh, Gulfisha Fatima, the uh, Shaheen Bagh activists, young activists, and they are students. Their bails have been denied by the same courts. So the courts know that women are now claiming the public. They are claiming the Republic and they are not to be sent back. But still, this, um, this uh, suggestion was made by the um, uh, by very own uh, Chief Justice because um, 
all the right wing state is doing is actually to criminalize all movements and they find it easier to criminalize the movement when 50 percent of the protesting people are sent back home that is women and it's easier to criminalize the rest of the 50 percent so uh, there's been um, the challenge of women um, to women participating in these movements is multifold it's denying them their identity also so now turning to the question of um, gender and caste that um, uh, uh, prachi you raised uh, they're talking of two important things here both gender um, and caste women farmers and uh, laborers have been completely written off out of the policy they're completely written out of policy when whereas the reality is that they bear the most burden of um, the distress economic um, as well uh, as the agrarian distress which india's um, farming communities are um, uh, bearing at the moment we know uh, if only from Punjab, the official data says that there were 17,000 suicides that happened in India uh, between the year 2000 to year 2015. Of these, um, um, almost 17,000, 9,000 and some are farmers, 7,000 and some odd are laborers. So laborers, landless laborers, a majority, a massive majority, um, nearly all of them are Dalit. So oh, the Dalit landless laborers have also been bearing the uh, cost of agrarian crisis and have been killing themselves. Now, this becomes three suicides a day in a tiny state of Punjab. And many of the women from suicide families were actually came to the borders last month and, and they were carrying photographs of their loved ones, husbands, sons, fathers, fathers-in-law. Some were carrying two pictures of their husband and son or father or um, son. So um, there was a great crisis was embodied there. It was writ large on their frail uh, bodies. And, and they came and they showed um, to the world that this is a agrarian crisis and uh, what women are actually bearing the crisis. They are, um, when men die, women have to not only put food on the table, uh, their land goes because it's the indebtedness which is making um, farmers and uh, laborers to kill themselves. So they've been organizing themselves also. In Punjab, there is now uh, a Kisan Mazdoor Khudkushi Pirit Parivar Committee. Uh, it's the families of the um, people who've committed suicides. There's a committee um, at the moment which, which says that farmer suicides are not suicides they are institutional murders because it's the policy uh, state policy agrarian policy which is making farmers to take away their lives and this particular um, committee was founded by Kiranjit Kaur uh, a very young woman whose father died and she felt that um, the family is um, reduced to nothing so she started collecting data from all over punjab going from village to village and it uh, draws a parallel if people know the history of kashmir that it was parvina ahangar who lost her son whose son disappeared and she started um, association for parents of disappeared children she went from village to village collecting data because no the state wasn't doing it. Similarly, Kiran Jeet Kaur in Punjab, a young university student, started collecting this data and putting it together. And when she put it together, it was clear that most of the women have been reduced to destitution. And there, so there, uh, how women are experiencing agrarian crisis is actually um, quite distinct and very intense. Now for Dalit women, uh, laboring women, it's even more difficult. One, when they die, the men die, they are not able to um, show that this is because of agrarian distress, because their uh, or indebtedness is not through banks. They have no collateral, so they don't get money from banks. They, they are indebted to private money lenders. 
they um, since their suicides are not recorded as farm related suicides they are not they don't get any compensation which the other farmers get about 2 lakh 3 lakh um, it keeps changing but landless women haven't been uh, getting any of those uh, the compensation of also after green revolution women completely lost because of mechanization of agriculture they completely lost all employment every uh, agriculture in punjab haryana and green revolution belt is now uh, completely mechanized so this women have no work my own work in villages show that they only find casual labor work uh, from between 60 to 110 days in a year and that too on a wage which is not even minimum wage which is not even um, um, equal to male wage so they have been in the labor market their standing is nothing they don't have any social standing and that also gets then connected to um, their um, standing in the eyes of um, the most powerful so violence against women rapes of dalit women um, their right over their bodies bodily integrity and bodily autonomy is not guaranteed to dalit women it's there because what they do fetches no economic value they what they do is of immense value like dairy like care work like cleaning it's very fundamental to what uh, to an agrarian economy but they but it has no value because it's considered extension of housework which has no value so um, it's very important um, has been important for them to also come together and um, very very interesting developments in the last few years seven to eight years women have formed dalit women have formed uh, committees uh, there's one such uh, committee which is called zameen prapti sangharsh committee which uh, this committee is actually seeking one third of um, um, commons land for dalits for cultivation they are also asking uh, for uh, land reforms to be implemented and all the um, uh, excess land is given to dalits and also to landless so this uh, is seriously challenging the 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 apple cart uh, in rural economy but dalits are organizing and women are in the lead we also have not only uh, um, these women organizing in rural areas but people like nodeep kaur who is uh, bringing um, casual laborers working in urban cities together to form form the alliance with uh, farmers uh, so uh, so what we are seeing um, that in women's leadership a lot of new alliances are being formed and um, the alliances which they began to see uh, in cases where um, cases of rape and violence against women where both jat women and dalit women fought together and these issues were also taken by a number of large labor unions in punjab to forge this unity this is now has begun to prosper and in this farm struggle uh, we are seeing very interesting ways in which uh, dalit laborers have come to the movement how their uh, demands are now beginning to be included when uh, the movement began it was only three farm laws today number of unions are talking about land reforms there are number of unions which are talking about minimum wage and women from every platform are raising the demand for equal wages for minimum wages to be implemented mm. so what we are seeing is a very special moment in our histories yeah wow thank you narchar and i think we are uh, you know i know like bill said we we don't have enough time to really get into everything but you know this is just this is just the beginning of this conversation in in, in terms of thinking about what you know what are we truly able to do to um defeat the larger structure right and i think there are questions of whether uh you know also these movements how they're able to now with you know larger solidarity from across different movements whether whether they you know the farmers movement is able to when the immediate demands of what they're what they're asking for um you know how successful they'll be in ending these farm laws 
but also of course i think the inspiration that these movements have given you know a lot of us are thinking about what implications this has for um for our prospects to truly shake the foundations of the hindutva led fascist government uh that is in power right now and so i would love to hear kind of from both of you now and i'm sure and bill it, you know to reflect on this because in the context of the us also what what impact that has mass uprisings like BLM and other movements, uh, even the youth-led sun Sunrise Movement, had in getting Trump out of the office? But Trump is out of the office, but Trumpism is still in office in many ways uh, through through the, the people that still continue to support him who are in power. So how can these movements become catalysts for a larger defeat of fascist and genocidal re regimes and their tendencies? And you know what can we as progressives people living in the diaspora who are supporting work there in the in India or you know how we think about that globally too um so either of you um if you want to take on bill or no sure how and much we, time do we have Prashi? go ahead bill. go ahead yeah. bill <laughs> okay um, Tell us. well here's my thought uh one is that we have to understand that when we mobilize so does the right. So on the so if you look at what happened in the United States in 2020, um, the massive protests and uprisings uh, in response to the George Floyd murder by the police and other police uh, murders inspired um, unprecedented levels of uh, mobilization uh, by progressives. But as it turns out, it also inspired the right. And that the right, uh, seeing mass, this mass wave, uh, did not sit back. They weren't, they weren't panicked, they weren't neutralized, they responded. So one of the things that we've got to understand is that for every action, there is a reaction. When we mobilize, as in the case in India, there will be a reaction and the reaction it is not necessarily going to be just repression from the government. Um, it, it seems to me that it's very popular, possible that there will be mass responses that are inspired by the right wing against the forces that were engaged in this. And we've got to be prepared for that. The second thing uh, that's related is what I was saying earlier. We've got to think about how do we win and what does winning look like? Uh, how do we cripple the other side? Not just how do we bring them to a standstill, but actually how do we cripple them so that they are less able to mount a counteroffensive, uh, if at all? And, and I don't think that we've answered that question in the United States. Um, and, and I guess the related to that then is that we defeated Trump in the United States, there's a very strong right-wing populist movement that has within it a fascist armed wing. Um, if we are not fighting for power, we will be eliminated. Because that is, I mean, we're at a point in history where the, the right wing doesn't simply want to defeat us in the ballot box. They want to eliminate us as a force. And I think that what we're seeing in India, whether it was uh, what the actions taken against Kashmir or whether we're seeing what's happening with farmers, Modi and company want to eliminate the progressive forces. They want to annihilate them. So the question then is, well, what do we do? And it's not just about strengthening our skills at debating. I'll leave it at that. True, Bill. I don't. I mean, I totally agree with uh, what um, Bill is saying. Um, um, I I think it's it, it's a very hard battle. Um, the only um, point that we are seeing is that uh, Modi did try to crush this movement, also as they tried to crush uh, uh, Shaheen Bagh. 
um, mm. COVID came in handy uh, to crush uh, and pulverize Shaheen Bagh, which hasn't happened in the case of farmers movement. And whether or not these three laws are repealed, I think this farmers movement has won. Um, it has been able to forge such alliances and breach the fault lines which existed um, in India of caste um, uh, most, uh, and regionalism, uh, they've been able to actually make um, um, uh, way into larger solidarity, building larger solidarities. Um, I think this movement has, and I will only take a minute just to now say that this movement has given us hope. And it has put the indomitability of Mr. Modi's will on test. Um, it's a beautiful move, movement. It's a joyous movement because it's minus hate. We've seen so much hate in the last six years in India that this movement, which is building on solidarity, which is uh, actually talking about love, it's actually talking about uh, uh, bridging um, the existing um, rivalries, that um, it's such a joyous movement and this gives us a reason to say Zindabad. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Zindabad. And, you know, I think one of the ways that we can win is by having hope, you know, that's uh, it's it's mm -hmm. truly the the inspiration that we can we need to do that. And I think, Bill, Thank you so much for uh, for all all of your your comments and your your most important questions and now Sharon for just painting the picture and and also just covering so much about what is happening on the ground. We really will I think uh, you know get into these questions not just in terms of conversation and talk but I think that's why ICWI is is there to found it to really think about what we can do from here and what actions we can do to support the, the movements and the, the actors that are there doing the work on the ground. So we, we will continue this. This is not the last conversation we'll have with you, Bill and Usher, and, and uh, thank you so much for doing this. Um, we're gonna bring thank on Sunny's video and um, we'll, we'll, until later, thank you. Thanks.
Hi, Sunny. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, so Sunny, you and I uh, have been part of uh, diaspora organizing and, you know, left activism here for a long time. So I think part of what we're talking about today, you know, the questions of global solidarity and, you know, uh, diaspora consciousness. And, and I, I would love, I would love for you to maybe talk a little bit about what, you know, what inspired you to make these, uh, well, write these songs and then also um, the particular videos, right? The, mm -hmm. both the videos that we played, the first one we played was the visuals were mostly Shaheen Bag, and this one was, uh, you know, it's, it's talking about larger visions. So, you know, would love for you to talk a little bit about that. And then, you know, what, you know, how do you see your work um, and, you know, our, our activism in general uh, contributing to the larger project of building a culture of solidarity and diaspora consciousness and what do you think we could do? And, you know, part of this is these beautiful songs that you've made is just, you know, in part of, you know, participation of cultural um, aspects within the movement too, we've seen and I'm not sure and talked about, talked about that a little bit too. So this is just an extension of that in some ways that I see, but would love to hear from you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, thanks so much, and and it's an honor to to be a part of this this conversation and in this way. Um, and thanks, Nafsharan and Bill, for for all you brought to it, and to you too, Prachi. Um, yeah, I mean, really, where y'all ended the conversation, thinking about uh, thinking about hope and the sort of. Uh, uh, radical optimism that that uh, Navsharan kind of put on display at the end that that the the farmers have already won in a way um, is really uh, is really the feeling I'm going for in in my music and with this current project um, and and the last uh, the last track that we heard in the video that we saw is called Chardikala, um, which for those who don't know this is the idea of sort of ever rising spirits uh, and revolutionary eternal optimism in in the Sikh community. Um, as you know, uh, uh, there's a, a, a very large Punjabi and Sikh population uh, at the forefront of, of the farmers movement. And, you know, I wrote this song a, a couple of years ago. Um, the music, of course, the, the lyrics are not my own. The lyrics uh, are both coming from sort of Sikh and Punjabi sayings, as well as from uh, Sikh prayers. Um, and when I wrote this music, it was, uh, it was in 2018, in a time when I was personally feeling a lot of desperation um, with the rise of Bolsonaro, with the increased popularity of Modi and Trump um, and Duterte and, you know, this sort of global tide of, uh, of fascism that, that we've been discussing in this conversation, um, more and more acts of white supremacist violence and terror in the United States, right? Uh, and for me, I had to think back to this and remind myself of this sick idea and practice of Chardikala that even in the darkest and toughest of times, it is both a spiritual obligation and a political obligation to remain in high spirits, right? We, we will not win. We will not make any gains for respect, dignity, or justice uh, if we lose hope, right? If we take our eyes off the prize, if we, if, if we lose that connection to each other and to our broader vision uh, for justice, for respect, for liberation. Um, and to me, that's what Jardikala is all about. Um, and so that's why I wanted to foreground that idea in my music. And, and that's you know, aside from this particular song, Chardikala, that's kind of the role that I see as my uh, for myself as a musician as well, right? To keep uh, people in high spirits, to lift uh, to lift our spirits and fuel our struggles for for justice and liberation. And when I when I see all the imagery uh, from the farmers' protests these last few months, and and look at that the, the resistance and uh, sort of relentlessness. Uh, and fearlessness of of the farmers and the laborers, um, I'm I'm deeply inspired. Right, it it just feels like a an embodiment of that spirit of Jardikala. Um, and so when I put this track out, um, you know, I very much wanted to both uplift that struggle uh, and 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 build uh, build solidarity because I think they're they're the epitome of Jardikala. And sometimes um, I don't know if there's uh, a lot of other six. Uh, in this in this meeting, I can't really tell because people's videos aren't on and I can't see everyone's names. But but sometimes this idea of Chardikala is sort of like oversimplified is just meaning oh be happy. We're always happy, and that's and that's not what it's about, right? It's not about always being happy. It's about uh, it's about being steadfast in our determination for justice. And for me, the farmers are, are kind of the epitome of that. I like that um, steadfastness. Um, I also wanted to ask Sunny, you know. Um, 
these videos have been out there for a few few months now, right? And uh, what what have you heard from you know the whether it's the diaspora, South Asian diaspora, or larger diaspora, and you know both in maybe you can talk both about the positive parts and the negative comments that I'm sure that you've received and um, you know how how you've reacted to those. Yeah, it's been it's been a journey. This one that we just saw uh, just came out about uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, but the first one we watched came out um, in October or November, um, and that one is a very direct uh, confrontation to to Modi, of course, and and uh, the CAA and NRC really uplifting that struggle um, with really incredible imagery that. Uh, that uh, was was lent to us by the Jamun Collective in in Delhi, who Prachi actually connected me to. Um, so really grateful for that. Just inspiring imagery. And um, as as many of you likely know, anytime uh, we put our voices out there uh, against the Modi regime's policies in in any way, um, well, someone like someone that looks like me, kind of the first thing that happens is a barrage of, of trolls calling me a Khalistani terrorist. That's usually, that's usually like point number one that happens. Um, I, I, the, the Modi troll army is, is, is quite overwhelming, um, but that, that, that to, be, to me is, is to be expected. And I, I, you know, just from, from being an activist and being outspoken on these issues for, for years, I'm not surprised by it, but it has been also, you know, there's been a ton of support and, and a ton of excitement from, uh, from within the Sikh community and, and, and the South Asian community more broadly. And then, and then folks who are, who are just starting to learn about these issues um, through my music. And to me, that's just so important to me that uh, that part of what my music can do and what, what these videos can do is, is bring, uh, bring these movements and these struggles to, to an audience outside of, uh, outside of Punjabi community, outside of Sikh community, outside of South Asian diasporic communities. So, I, I both hope to lift lift our spirits and fuel those of us who are already supporting and a part of these movements, but also um, also to get this message out a little bit farther. And 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 I think that's starting to happen. You know, releasing music during this pandemic has been a been a challenging thing in and of itself, um, where uh, we're just inundated with so much online and and so many <laughs> Zoom events. But it's great to see a lot of people on on this one because there's a lot of a lot of richness and. Um, uh, and yeah, so it's been, it's been a mix, but, oh, but overall, um, I've been really, uh, really encouraged by, by the response. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. We, uh, you know, we, we hope you put out more. Do you have any plans for, uh, any, any other, uh, ones coming up? Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm, I'm going to keep on keeping on, um, don't, don't have a date for the next one yet, but, uh, but by the end of the year, I'll put out the whole album. I, you know, COVID has kind of changed the timeline a little bit. Uh, so I, I've stretched it out a little bit and hoping that, um, you know, in a few months, perhaps some outdoor live shows will be, will be coming back. Um, and then uh, I, I will eventually put out the whole, the whole album. Great. Well, thank you so much, Sunny. I hope you know that there's been a lot of comments about your video and just people have loved it, not just you know here, but I think it's it really inspired a lot of people. And I hope you keep producing, and I hope you hope you keep putting them out there. And, and I think it's not easy to put it out, work as a solo artist, and I think you know especially during the pandemic. So we thank you for doing that, and thank you for inspiring us, and thank you for coming on today. Thank you so much for having me. Mm -hmm. It's an honor. Nice.